Howdy, Tri-State. Uh, we're starting our new sermon series this morning, a series called Framework, How Does the Bible Structure My Life? Um, so for the next four weeks, we're just going to be looking at sort of the subject of Scripture and looking not just in the Bible, but looking what, what the Bible says about the Bible, of what the Bible says about itself, really. Uh, and, and so each week, we're kind of looking at different aspects of Scripture, um, different, different ways that we articulate and describe Scripture, um, not, not just from, from the academic, intellectual perspective, but, but also looking at sort of these street-level ways that some of these topics kind of, kind of influence our lives. And, and so the, the whole sort of word picture we're trying to lay out is this whole idea of the framework um, that the Scripture actually forms this, this infrastructure for the way I live. Um, see, see, for a very long time, we, we lived in a world that emphasized Scripture as the foundation for, for my life, the foundation for our faith. And so um, we attended classes that would, that would be designed to instruct us, help us memorize the different Bible stories. Um, there'd be like a flannel graph board there. Um, we would like to you know, watch like talking vegetables, talk about, you know, David and Joseph. And the whole, the whole principle was that we would watch these things, we would participate in these things so that, so that we could learn and that we could actually like apprehend what the Bible says basically about some very specific topics. And so we saw all of those things as being the foundation for everything in my life. But the problem, though, is that I don't live in the basement. Like, like all of us, as much as we love the idea of having this, this secure, firm foundation, none of us live in the basement. And, and so what we have to do, that the challenge before us, now and always, is to take the truths of Scripture and lift them out of the musty basement of intellect and, and put them into the infrastructure that, that undergirds everything else in our lives. So that when I go to work, when I go to school, when I do anything, that the, the Bible is now, now forming the framework for, for how I do that, the skeletal system for everything in my life. And so this morning, we're talking about the subject of the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. See, everybody lives under some form of authority one way or the other. I mean, even the great theologian Bob Dylan said that you, you, you got to serve somebody, right? And, 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 and listen, now, now that NFL season is here, okay, a lot of us are going to try to identify ourselves with the authority of the NFL or the authority of our favorite player because people are going to be walking around wearing jerseys with different guys' names on the back, right? Because we want to, we want to identify with someone that we view as an authority or someone that we view their identity very highly. Authority means basically this. Authority asks the question, asks and answers the question, how do I know something is true? Like, like authority, how do I know something is true? It's, it's the reason we trust CNN or Fox News over, say, Wikipedia, right? Because we, we want to know that, that the authority that we trust um, is actually, you know, we can trust, we can rely on it, we can, we can trust it, it can bear the weight of our questions and our scrutiny. And so for a very long time here, here in Western culture, we've lived basically within a framework that said that, okay, Christianity can kind of influence a variety of our, our arts and judicial system. But now we've moved away from that into what we now call a post-Christian world, where Christianity is now assumed to be the problem, not the solution. And to sort of slide back and to rely on the pages of Scripture seems very much to many people just, just an archaic throwback to a leave-it-to-beaver style of America full of sexual repression and racial segregation, and no one wants that. And so now we, we all live under our, our own authority that, that my morality is basically up to common sense or personal perspective. And the whole idea of actually placing myself under the authority of an ancient document like the Bible is tantamount to throwing your brain away and relying instead on a, a whole system of priests and pastors and other, you know, uneducated people that we just can't rely on. And, and so how that works in the church world is, is simply this. Like, if you've grown up in church, 
um, what happens is that, that very much like a, like a virus or, or, or like flu season, we, we become inoculated to the gospel. Like we get just enough that we build up an immunity to it, so we end up coming back here week after week after week, and we hear the same words of Scripture over and over again, and we, we think that we've got it, but, but Scripture fails to undergird, to form the framework for, for everything in our life. And, and that's why Leslie Newbegin, who was a former missionary to India, um, came back to America, and he said that for the first time in, in, to memory, um, Western culture has reemerged as a mission field like never before. And so now we actually have to preach the gospel in ways that actually not just present the facts and the information of the gospel, but preach the gospel in a way that, that, that untangles all of the challenges and all the strange thinking that goes on even within the walls of contemporary evangelical Christianity. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to, to Jude. It's a strange book, I know. Um, Start, start with the maps in the back, okay, and t- turn left, and you'll find Revelation, and right before that, okay, I got in third John, okay, Jude is right there, okay, it's, it's all, all one book, like there's no like Jude chapter one, chapter two, verse three, or it's all just one solid book. Um, it actually starts out, um, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Um, kind of weird, because Jude was actually Jesus' brother also, or half-brother, I guess, technically. Um, but, but Jude, like most of his other siblings, never believed that Jesus was the Messiah in Jesus' lifetime. In fact, we actually don't exactly know how Jude ever came to faith in, his, his, in Jesus, um, Tom Schreiner in his commentary on, on Jude says that maybe James, to whom Jesus appeared, maybe James was somehow influential in, in Jude's conversion. We don't really know, but, but sometime after the fact, um, Jude, like all of his other siblings, um, took on renewed faith in, in the resurrected Jesus. And, and that's an important thing, right? Like, like our faith is built on the fact that a guy died and rose from the dead. Like, like no other religion opens itself up to scrutiny like that. Like every other major religion out there, as, it, as, as a starting point, um, the personal experience of its founder. You, you know, like, like, like Muhammad had the vision from the angel. Um, Joseph Smith had a similar type of vision. We have... You know, Siddhartha Gautama had this vision and became enlightened and became the first Buddha. Like, we have all these different religious founders out there having these incredible religious experiences. But here's the thing. I can't, I can't prove them wrong. Maybe these guys really did have a dream. Maybe they really did have an experience. I can't prove that. I can't disprove that. It's like this. If, if you have a brother uh, and your brother dies... Uh, and you come and you, and, you, and you say to your friends, listen, um, my brother appeared to be in a dream and told me to start a new religion. Um, so, so let's get together this weekend, and you owe me five bucks. Okay, you are, you're going to have a miserable time starting your own religion. Because no one can prove or disprove that your brother appeared to you in a dream. But if you come and you say to your friends, listen, my brother died, but three days later he came back to life, and he's out there walking around down, downtown Chambersburg. Okay, now suddenly, that's something we can actually prove or disprove. And if you want to disprove Christianity, as Romans strongly did in the first century, all you need to do is go to the grave and show, show the, the, the body still rotting there in the tomb. And, and the most shocking thing about Christianity is not that it opens itself up to that level of scrutiny. It's the fact that no one has ever proved it wrong. So that, that's all that's sort of the, the, the precursor here to Jude, the starting point of all our discussion. Listen, it's, it's, it's something we can examine historically. So Jude, Jude has experienced that, and now he lives in a culture full of all these different rival teachers because now Jesus had, just had disrupted everything in such a staggering way that now everyone's going to try to piece together the facts, and there are those within the walls of the early church or those who are trying to come, come within the walls of the early church and say, listen, this whole Christianity thing, um, we have to do things our way. So this is what J- uh, Jude says. This is starting in verse 
um, 3. He says, listen, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a person out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels did, who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yikes, right? I mean, this is the kind of language that we would we dismiss entirely in our world today as being politically incorrect. I mean, I mean, we can't possibly uh, imagine a God like this. I mean, look at verse 5. I mean, verse 5 kind of captures sort of the, the tension that we have to live with, that, that God loved his people enough to save them, but he also loved them enough that, that when they violated his good and, and pleasing purpose, he had to punish them so that, that they would not violate and destroy that which he created. And, and, and that's a really hard thing to live with, especially in our culture today, that says that, listen, the, the best form of love is acceptance and letting people you know, live the way that they want to live no matter, no matter what. I, I mean, even, even Jude says this. I mean, it, I'll read verse 8. I wasn't playing this, but for verse 8, it says this, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. I mean, we live in a world that, that authority has just moved away entirely from, from traditional forms to, to non-traditional forms to personal forms that, that, that I can live my life any way I want. And, and we celebrate that. And we baptize that, and we, we assume that this is the absolute greatest way to live. And, and so what I want to do for you in the next few minutes, um, so I, want, I want to kind of just take sort of Jude's sort of model of, of looking at these different sort of false teachings and these different, different ways of looking at it. And, and, I, and I, want to, I want to kind of unpack that. Um, I, I want to unpack that in a way that, that, that doesn't just, you know, provide more information for you to digest. Um, I want to unpack that in, in the context of some various um, what I call street-level arguments that, that either you will hear out there or alternately, if you're here this morning, you, you may yourself um, at the very least struggle to understand why it is that Christianity says some very basic things. So, so it, is the Bible too restrictive? Many in our world would say yes. Uh, I'm highlighting three, three particular areas. F first of all, um, is the Bible culturally restrictive? Culturally restrictive. In other words, um, are, are these statutes or the examples we find in the pages of Scripture too restrictive for the world today? Um, in, in, in one sense, the answer is a, a resounding yes, the Bible does restrict. I mean, the Bible says that, listen, um, broad the path of destruction, but narrow the gates that lead to righteousness. I mean, Jesus says, listen, there is a restriction that comes from following me. Like, like to follow one thing means I'm not following something else. So, so, so no matter what you believe, you will always restrict yourself in one way or the other. But listen, I, I understand that, that in today's world, when we open the pages of, say, the Old Testament, um, it seems really, really weird to see those, those types of stories where we see people just being abused, we see people um, living in a culture that, that seems so foreign, so violent, um, so, so misogynistic in the, its treatment of women. Um, it, it just it seems very strange that we would ever align ourselves with a God who writes a book like that. And, and, and I understand that, and, and, and here's the thing, I agree with you. Uh, at least in the sense that the, the pages of the Old Testament do portray a culture um, that's gone horribly awry. And there's a really great author named, named Robert Alter from UC Berkeley. And Alter wrote this really great book called, called The Art of Biblical Narrative, 
And his whole book is about the fact that, listen, you don't have to be a Christian because well, Alter doesn't believe a word the Bible says. He says the Bible isn't, isn't true at all, but it's a really ancient document that formed the basis for a culture. But he said this. He said that within the pages of Scripture, unlike any other ancient document out there, we find certain, certain ways of describing cultural practices that were radically subversive. In other words, it, when, it, when the Bible describes things like polygamy, when, when the Bible describes things like um, giving, giving the majority of your inheritance to the firstborn son, when the Bible describes those types of things, it, it usually does sort of show how, how horrible things turn out when you, when you go that way. But like, read the stories of, like, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. I mean, read the stories of, of guys who, who had lots of wives and, and didn't really do well with any of them. Like, like read the story of David, who, who kept, like, literally collecting women, um, and then when he saw a hottie across the rooftop named Bathsheba, um, it, it, it went even worse for him. So, so Alter is saying, this, he's, this is coming from a guy who doesn't believe anything, but he's saying, listen, the, the Bible itself is, is describing a, a world that, that's in, in ways that are, that are culturally subversive that actually overturn our expectations of, of what is or is not restrictive. Secondly, is the Bible religiously restrictive? Um, I mean, John 14, 6 says that, listen, Jesus, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to God except through me. So, so in one sense, the Bible is religiously restricted, but, but here's, here's the thing. Um, it, it, everyone, deep down, is religiously restrictive. Like, each, each person in the world restricts their view of religion in some way or another. Like, we usually hear it this way, like the whole, like, illustration of the elephant and the blind men. The, the king has the elephant in his courtroom, so he invites these three blind men to come in to, to figure out what this animal actually is. And so the one guy feels the leg and says it's like a big tree trunk. Um, another guy feels the actual trunk of the elephant. It's like a snake. Um, one guy feels the rear end of the elephant. says it's like a congressman. But I'm... And... Um, <laughs> Republican, right? Yeah. And so the, the, the point that's often drawn from the story is that, listen, when we approach God, um, every religion out there kind of is one of those blind men. Like, we come and we feel our way along, and listen, I, we, we have our holy book, right? And, and our holy book portrays God in one way, but, but the Quran or, or the Gita, I mean, that, those holy books might portray God in a slightly different way. And who are we to say what's right and wrong? And, and, and Newbegin, again, um, Leslie Newbegin, former missionary to India, who's heard all these arguments before, he says, listen, we, we always tell this story from the perspective of the king. And what we should be asking instead is, what's an elephant? Because the blind men can't know, but the king knows. And when we tell that story, we also assume that we know. In other words, we, we tell the story assuming that we know objectively and now we have our, our absolute place of authority to sit and mock those who only get portions and parts of the truth. Let me, let me say this differently. Like, like, like even like in your homes and your offices and your workplaces, I, I mean, what we often hear is that, listen, that, that there, there are no absolutes in this area. I mean, there might be one absolute truth, but, but what we're limited to now is our own personal perspective. Like, we feel our way along just like the blind man and the elephant. And, and listen, th that, that way of thinking is every bit as restrictive and every bit as condescending and arrogant as Christianity. Because what you're saying is, is this. What you're saying is, it, it, let, me, let me say it this way in terms of personal stories. I'm going to confuse all of you otherwise. Like, like I was sitting and having some, some dinner over, over sushi with some of my, my former college friends who, who also are... are I mean, nomin nominally educated in Christianity, but don't really believe. And, and what she was saying is that, listen, like she, she has friends who, who have these different beliefs, and she has other people who have these different beliefs, and she doesn't believe that, that Christianity has any kind of absolute right to say what's right or wrong. We should just let people just kind of live their life based on what they want to do. So I said, listen, so you, you, you are saying that what you believe, that when we, are in, when we encounter diverse opinions, we should be tolerant. And, of course, the answer was yes. 
And, so, and, I, and you believe that tolerance is, is the best way to approach these other beliefs. Well, of course, the answer was yes. So, so, so what you're saying is um, your approach is superior to all other approaches, uh, and, and you believe that everyone should think the way you do. And of course, there was no answer to that question. See, see in other words, our, our, our value of religious tolerance can be every bit as restrictive and arrogant and oppressive as our value for religious um, particularism. So when Christianity says that Jesus is the only way to God, yes, that, that is restrictive, but, but so are all other claims about God. Third, uh, morally restrictive. I mean, after all, can't, can't we simply let people be, be moral in their own way? Um, I, I mean, are we simply not placing extra undue burdens on people by expecting them to live by ancient documents? And, and here's the thing. What, what usually happens culturally, historically speaking, is, is that we, we make, we, we just change one va- set of values for another. Like it, like it used to be we would draw very strict boundaries around right and wrong, and, and those who are, are in, inside the boundary, are the good people. And if you're, you're Christians, then, then we're the really good ones. And those who are outside that boundary are the bad people, like those who, who don't conform to, to our religious preconceptions. That, that was historically where we were. Okay, now where we are is we, we've still drawn the boundary but now the people who are in are the really open-minded people, the people who are, have the, you know, the coexist bumper sticker on the back of their Prius. No offense, Ken Garber, your Prius. Um, the folks who, who are, are, are advocate tolerance for you know, any number of lifestyle choices, and those who are out are, are those who, who insist that we place restrictions on anybody. And so the, the closed-minded are out, the open-minded are in. And, that, and that's why, you know, the recent, like, Chick-fil-A controversy was so strong is because we saw that, that same collision of values. And, and so, so morally restrictive, yes, but, but so is our, our new system of values of being open-minded versus closed-minded. You'll always draw boundaries. You'll always restrict. The only question is what values determine that boundary. Um, so, so, listen, um, Li- living, living according to society's authority, society's standards, w- will not lead you to lasting joy. Um, Christianity says that, that, yes, following Jesus will lead you to lasting joy. And, and there, there are three reasons I want to highlight then for you just very quickly as, as we wrap up. The, fir- the first is simply this, that, that God is holier than you think. Like the reason that, that Jude can say, listen, there was a time when, when God, the Trinity, Jesus, that God saved his people from Egypt to destroy them later is because God has these high, just this ferociously high standards of righteousness that none of us can obtain. And, and so God, just throughout human history, has just relentlessly pursued his people despite the fact that we are a wayward, wicked, idolatrous, adulterous race who wants nothing to do with God, yet he's reaching in continually to save us. And here's what that means. It it means that if we claim to follow Jesus, there are are more important things in life um, than simply coming to church on Sunday, simply being a good person, there, there are more important things in life also than simply living life in a way that doesn't harm someone else. Like, like most people in our world today would say, that, listen, what's wrong with my lifestyle as long as I'm not hurting anyone? But Christianity says that there is a higher standard, a higher calling to glorify God, to demonstrate his significance in every aspect of my life. And if that's true, then now suddenly I'm called to live in a way that's very different. I was, I was going down um, through downtown Hagerstown recently, and it was a, it was a busy, I think, a week, weekend afternoon um, right there in downtown, left lane um, on either side. There, the, all the parking spaces were taken up, and, and in the right lane um, comes a fire truck. And, and the fire truck is, like, pulling up beside me. Um, it's behind some guy in a pickup truck. 
who has stopped at the red light. So the, the light is red, uh, no driver has anywhere to go, the fire truck has its sirens going, the driver is like blaring the horn, um, yelling out the window, and I'm like, bro, slow your roll. I mean, the, li the light is red, the truck has nowhere to go without causing another accident. Meanwhile, like, like Captain Biceps and Mustache is like going crazy trying to plow his way through this intersection. And, and I, like for, for a good solid week, like I couldn't get over how much of a jerky this guy was. And then, I th and then I thought, if I'm ever in an accident, if I'm ever hurting, and I have to call 911, I'm requesting that guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I want the guy who's like, like, no, like, pull out all the stops. Like, I'm going to crush anyone in my way to get, get this guy who might be, like, bleeding or whatever. Like, I want the guy who was relentless. I want the guy who's a little bit of an arrogant jerk. And, and listen, if, if Christianity is true and, and God is the most powerful being conceivable, th then we worship a God who is just relentless in his pursuit of his people who are so far from him. We, we want a God like that. Like, we want a God who, who doesn't tolerate injustice. We want a God who is all about rescuing his people. Secondly, freedom is more complex than you think. Uh, we assume that freedom means the absence of all restriction, but there are, there are times and there are ways when, when freedom um, and, and joy can be found in limiting yourself and restricting yourself and binding yourself. And, and we, we have nowhere else to look other than the, the institution of marriage. Uh, um, I, I was reading a book recently about a, from a sociologist called Mary Go Round, M-A-R-R-Y, Mary Go Round, it's a pun, very funny. And uh, it's a big hat, it's funny. Um, and anyway, he, he, argued, he argued that in our world today, we, we, we hold that marriage as a very high value, but secondly, we also tend to view marriage as a means by which my needs are met and fulfilled. And, and, and the result is that we have people marrying at, at a fairly steady rate, um, but we have divorce just skyrocketing. Why? It's because we always assume that, that marriage will, will fulfill me, will, will bring all my needs to fulfillment, will, will give me lasting joy. And, and listen, the, the, what Christianity says is that when you marry someone, you become one flesh with that person. It is a limiting of your, of your freedoms. It's a limiting of the things you used to be able to do. Like I have a friend who got engaged not too terribly long ago, and before he got married, he said, listen, I realize that marriage will mean giving up a lot of the things I used to do. Like when you're a single guy, um, you, you drink milk in one of two ways, either on your cereal or straight from the jug. Like no shame, no shame. But when you get married, like no more drinking milk from the carton, like no more late night runs to the drive through, like no more like watching like like sports nonstop, right? Like it, it means limiting yourself for all of those in all those ways. But he said this. He said that none of those things are, are worth the absence of marital faithfulness and bliss. Like when you get married, you, you, you give up some of those some of those things, but but that also means finding something far, far greater and far, far better. And Christianity works the same way. Yes, to follow Jesus means giving up maybe certain aspects of your life, and maybe it means restricting yourself in certain other ways. Maybe it means coming to church once a week, and even a small group once a week. Maybe it means adjusting your schedule. But when you do that, you find lasting joy. Third and final, love is deeper than you think. Love is deeper than you think. Our, our world today assumes that the most loving thing you can do for someone is to accept them just the way they are, to quote Billy Joel. And, and, and it's, it's dangerous that way because then, then it's not loving to say to someone that you have no ability to change. Like it's, I don't see it as being loving to say to that person, the, the way you are now is who you will always be. I think it's far, far more loving to tell someone that that in Christ, through his spirit, you have the power to change. It is far more loving to tell someone that, that listen, just as Paul said in Galatians 2.20, listen, I have been crucified with Christ. It's not I, but Christ who lives in me. 
Like, there is something far greater and far deeper about that kind of transformative love than merely patting someone on the head and saying, you're fine just the way you are. And so when we, when we live our lives as Christians, when we live our lives as men and women who follow just passionately after Jesus, we're, we're people who carry that same depth of love into our communities. Why? Because we have been bought with a price. We are now new creations in Christ. So when, I, when we enter our schools, when we enter our workplaces, when we enter our homes, our neighborhoods, we, we carry the newness of Christ's love so that all people can see that Christianity isn't just a means, a, a, a system of rules to follow, but it's a way for, for us to set our joy free. G.K. Chesterton said, once said that he, when he considered Christianity bef- before he became a Christian, when he looked at Christianity for the first time, he, he saw it as being a set of rules and, and a way of limiting himself to, to follow after God and follow after the Bible's teachings. But, but he said that, that once he began following Jesus, he began to realize that it wasn't really a, a set of principles or a set of rules, uh, but, but a, a way to let good things run wild. And so when we, when we open the Bible, we live under the authority of the Bible, y- yes, it, it, it might mean limiting our, our choices. It might mean restricting ourselves in, in some particular ways. But it also means just experiencing the joy of letting good things run so wild in our life that all men, through our example, are drawn to the risen and exalted Savior. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for just the... Um, awesome way that it calls all people to repentance, not merely repentance from sin, but also repentance from our shallow religion that says that I can live my life any way I want as long as I just say a few prayers here and there. Lord, we, we pray that we would see your word as much deeper than that, much more fulfilling than that, and that we would be people who just fall in love with your Son through every single word and every single page, and that through your word we would just be um, just guided, we would be governed, we would be shaped and molded into people who more closely resemble your Son than the broken images we often reflect. It's in his name we pray all these things, and by your Spirit's power. Amen.